In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Jesus, Mary, St. Joseph, St. Teresa, pray for us. St. John Francis and companions, pray for us. They were martyrs of the French Revolution. We're going to see a lot of martyrs. And there's a lot of martyrs right now, but there's going to be a lot more. And especially the priests are going to be martyred. And we're going to have this, unfortunately, we're going into this World War III. It's not a matter of if, but when, according to the Blessed Mother. And if you look in the Revelations, it's not a matter of if, but when. And only certain political things can happen that will only delay the onset of all these things, not, uh, or speed it up, actually. But uh, a lot of it's politic political, and the, with those Antichrists wanting to take full control, and he's on the earth right now, and we know who he is, at least Melanie does, and, and I've looked him up. You're not supposed to look him up, look at him in the eyes, it's because of his hypno, hypno, hypnotic qualities in his eyes. I guess he's got, like, glowing green eyes that will force people to to bow down and worship him. Oh, that sounds horrible. And we can we can sort of laugh like, oh, huh, that sounds silly. That sounds science fictional. Well, it's actually true. So you don't want to look in the eyes of the Antichrist. I can't say that enough. Don't look. Don't look. you got to throw your computers out of the window. After this uh, warning in the six weeks conversion time, you're not going to be able to look at the Antichrist. It doesn't matter how many rosaries you've said. It doesn't matter how many masses you've been to. It doesn't matter how, uh, you know, buttressed you've been up in the faith. Don't do it. Remember the pillar of salt story with Lot's wife. She looked back. So we just can't do this. We have to obey certain things our Lord asks us to do. Like he asked John Carroll Leary, don't travel. You know, and even if the people make fun of you, who cares? I mean, I've limited my travel as well. Things I've wanted to do, it's not like I maybe have been able to do them anyway. But it kind of comes to play. It comes to my mind, the John and Carol Leary show. When I think of these traveling, we're not supposed to travel, period. Are you going to do it or no? Are you going to just suffer the persecution and people making fun of you in the pews and stuff to do what God wants you to do? And it's sad. These prophecies I've been uh, reading about lately are really sad. It's, it's John Martinez and uh, um, Mission of Divine Mercy, <laughs> Mission of Schism Mercy, how they turn out to be. And it's, um, it's the way that this uh, Father John Mary Foster's decided to go. He decided to schism. He could have, uh, you know, done like he even says himself, the Padre Pio route, the sister, um, sister uh, Faustina route, where you just kind of patiently wait underneath your abusive superior for them to change and then... <laughs> wonderful things happen decades later and everything turns out okay well he doesn't want to do it that way we have to have patience for him we have to be patient for him we have to be patient for the bishops and uh you know our lord is, is talking about obedience and it's hard you ultimately have to do the will of god do i think does god want the schism no does god want father joseph mary removed out of the church no there's a lot of fake excommunications going on. So, men there have been for a long time. Remember, our Lord himself was burned outside the gate. So, we have to keep in mind that if people, just people, should get kicked out of the church against their own will or ex even excommunicated, we have to see that these things are wrong. <laughs> and it's a, like our Lord says in the prophecies, it's part of the schism, dark, deep church is what... Archbishop Vigano calls it, and he schism too. You see a lot of people schisming or just hanging on by a thread now in the church. And uh, it's kind of one way or the other, unless you're basically a complete communist and want communion in the hand and, and stuff, and you want these tight, tight pants on the altar and all this nonsense, or even, you know, I don't even want to go into details, but these, these girls are wearing these short, I don't even want to talk about it. You got the deacon smiling on the altar. It's like, what are you doing? Are you seriously going to smile at this apostasy on the altar of God? And, uh, you know, I'll probably just get kicked out of another church by saying it. And what can I do? What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go after that? Well, who knows? 
But God does take care of people who stand up for the truth. He doesn't necessarily give them wealth and riches on earth or even a long life. Look at John the Baptist. He was just beheaded. That was his reward for standing up for the truth. But he got to go straight to heaven. Now, St. Vladimir from Russia, his pagan sons got all the land and the wealth and the long life. And his Christian sons from his Christian marriage ended up dying young and getting martyred. And... From a worldly perspective, we can say, well, what as good as that? And, uh, but God's truth is not our ways. Our ways are always, uh, we want a lot of rationality and we want a lot of straight lines and stuff. We want to, we want to show a production, okay? We want to judge duty type situation where five minutes, everything's done and justice has been served and great. We don't like it when we see evil prosper and bad things happen or good people are shut down and struggling like like little bugs tipped over in their legs or, or you know, doing this. Uh, we see that and we don't want to look and it offends us and so we just walk away and that happens with me, that happens with a lot of people. If you, right now, if you walk, you know, you basically have to be doing this day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing the gospel and the teaching because everything is so schismatic and messed up in the church. You need people to, to try to try to try to make the the path straight again, and only God can really do that. But He does use people to do that. I know I'm gonna. Um, but anyway, my my holy communion so oh, it's so beautiful. I saw the gates of heaven and. and First of all, in the consecration, I saw these jewels. Oh, I saw I saw the holy face in the host. But I also saw all these jewels and beautiful precious stones. Our Lord loves the host. He he loves this institutional holy Eucharist. He loves it so much. And just the love between Jesus and the host. I was like, wow. It was like the best all the best diamonds and just precious stones in this thing. And he was so happy. I was like, I'm happy too, Jesus. This is so wonderful. I love it. I love your host too. I just want to be here forever. I'll just stay in this church. But we know it's not possible. God, he sends us out to by two. He sends us out against our own, our own will, you know. We just want the peace in the church, right? We just want to be, oh, I'm just like an angel in the church forever. I'll be your, I'll be your bride. You'll be my king. And we'll go live forever in this church. Amen? And so, I saw this, oh, the whole, there the chalice too. Like I said, the fire, I saw a big fire like a whirlwind fire, like Elijah or something. It's a mysterious fire. It's beautiful. It's like incense. And it goes up to the heavens and the coming out of the host or the chalice. I thought, oh, it's so beautiful. I wonder what it means. <laughs> it's so lovely. It, it wasn't, you know, like a terror, like a, like a cyclone, fire, tornado that would hurt. It was just so beautiful. Loved it. But I saw jewels too. Um, I saw the faces of people I've been praying for and people I love being pushed in mine, mostly their face. Isn't that cute? It's like their little face pushed into my heart. All the prayers I had for people, it's being pushed in my heart and our Lord took it out and it was his heart. I thought, Lord, I didn't know you cared. I didn't know you wanted what I wanted. I thought I was just being selfish and greedy, praying for everybody so that my life could be made better by their conversion, you know? <laughs> I think the easy way out. I pray for you, you come to the faith, and then, then you're a better person, and I get relief, right? But anyway, that's how we think. But I didn't know my prayers were so in line with the Lord. I actually thought maybe I should say different or whatever. I don't know, but I was feeling encouraged to say certain prayers, right? I saw these, the faces. Oh, it's so beautiful. It goes right in my heart. And then I see the holy, the sacred heart. His prayers and my prayers are one. He likes the prayers. He likes the prayers of the family members' conversion. He loves them so much. He likes the prayers I have for my loved ones. He likes the prayers I have for my parents in their marriage. He likes the prayers I have for perverts in the church who are kind of creepy that I don't want to be around in the church. And I try to pray for them or try to avoid them. 
and and God even likes that prayer. I said, really? Wow, Jesus, this is so wonderful. I'm so glad that our prayers are, your, if I feel like my prayers and your prayers are one, that we can do this together. I'm not alone just praying and begging you and, and having you turn a blind eye on me. It's just so beautiful when I saw that sacred heart. Oh, it gave me so much joy. Then we went to, uh, we went to adoration, blessed sacrament. I saw the host again. It's so beautiful. Oh, so consoling, especially in these times, not knowing really what to do, not knowing sometimes what to do, what the best decision is for temporal decisions we make in the day. Like, well, do I buy this or that? It sounds silly, right? But sometimes, like, I'm considering, do I buy this big thing of peanut butter at the cash and carry or at, you know, wherever it is, like, chef store or not, you know? This big thing of peanut butter might be a good idea, but maybe I need to spend money on other things that are coming up. Who knows? And and just prayers for, for what to do in certain situations, avoiding evil in many ways, especially coming from our own relatives. We try to avoid unnecessary occasions of sin. It's really hard to avoid sometimes these. Some of them are, are involuntary and we cannot remove ourselves from them. And some of them really are voluntary and we can remove ourselves from near occasions of sin. We have to pray for the discernment to know what. I can't always remove myself from, uh, from a lot of the evils going on in the church when I need to go to Mass and things. That's an involuntary, um, involuntary uh, you know, t things that we have to deal with, uh, persecution, whatever. But the voluntary ones are maybe the ones we should try to weed out, right? Because um, unless we really feel the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that like St. Paul did when he went back to Jerusalem, knowing he would die, you know, we got to discern what is the best thing uh, for for the church, not just for us, but for the church. Anyway, I was praying to our Lord in the in the Blessed Sacrament. Lord, what should I do? And I heard, you shall teach. I heard it so big. You shall teach. I'm thinking, okay, I'll teach, I'll teach at home. But he said, you shall teach to all people and all nations. I'm like, wow, that kind of makes me want to drop over and, and get kind of overwhelmed a little bit with that. But, but if you want me to, Lord, then yes, I will. And I'll do it with joy and love. Because that's what Pope John Paul II did. That's what Pope Benedict did. And they they were able to do it. And uh, I'm a woman, you know. But it, but ultimately, women do teach too. Look at Saint. Look at all the women teachers who became saints. And it's easy to see that teaching and sainthood do go together. So if you're called to teach, it's a huge responsibility to be, but one really, really worth doing with your whole heart, mind, body, and soul. May God truly bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I just wanted to say one more thing and remind it. The Third World War, we have to protect the Jews. They are going to be persecuted again. And it may, it's probably going to be worse. than the, It may be worse than, unfortunately, this Holocaust we went through uh, in the 1940s. And I don't want to scare people, but I want to alert people. And the Catholics have... A responsibility to protect these race of people and we all have a responsibility to protect them from this genocide that has been on them for centuries the Old and New Testament trying to wipe out this race because they're the chosen race right our Lord himself is Jewish so is Blessed Mother so of course the this the devil does not want them around and is going to do everything he can to annihilate that race so we have to pray we have to be alert and by all means study the holocaust i know people don't want to you have to study it and learn i myself went to a dachau concentration camp when i was about 19 or 20 and uh, this stuff is very sobering and no one wants to study it but you need to remember what happened because it's coming people and it's coming again and it's going to be brutal and it's probably going to be worse. Just like the Third World War, we can only think it's going to be worse and not better. I don't mean to be a doomsday prophet, but we, I'm saying be ready, be ready to protect people and be ready to share the love of Jesus with them.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.